that's good enough. I can't stay quiet for really too long. <laughs> you guys are making this together. <laughs> I know. We, I was like, so anyway. Right, I, know. <laughs> I know. It just started with recordings on my phone. Uh-huh. And then I would listen back to it because initially I thought I was just going to blog about people's stories. Uh-huh. But then I was like, why am I retelling the story when people can just listen to it, th- you know, uh-huh. firsthand and then... I was afraid that I would, not intentionally, but just, you know, edit what things that I thought biased sure. me, right? Like, oh, right. this is really important, but what may be super important to me might be not so as important to someone else. So right. Like, we just need to, Go to the do source. it all. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Let them tell the story because, duh, that's more important, I think. It's great, though, Tina. So then you are putting these together for your production company. Yeah, I know. I'm just doing it for myself. I think it's great. It's but great. it's just, I don't know. I know. I, I have to get more comfortable with the words my production company. I know. I just <laughs> deliberately said it. <laughs> I know. So I'm like, oh gosh. How do you, because you're freelance, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you market yourself or get in there? Um, I, I just like, I'm uncomfortable with saying I market myself, uh-huh. actually. I don't know how to answer that. I would say, like, yeah. one job kind of leads to the next job, if we're yeah. lucky. Right. I will say, though, that people do seem to like to, we all like to pigeonhole each other so we can understand mm-hmm. each other quickly. And sometimes people say, so you're an opera designer. Oh, so you're a theater designer. Or you're a straight play designer. Or, no, you're a musical designer. Like, mm-hmm. And they, we try to understand what kind of designer each other is or directors yeah. do that to designers and I always just try to like really stand up to say like no I'm a designer so yeah. I can design anything like right. you know a swimmer can swim different strokes or a person can speak different languages right right so I think I just like to to do what I love and hopefully do it well and then that product hopefully leads to the next job because somebody yeah. recognizes oh that seems like it, that person could connect to this job right right so where did you start as a, a designer yeah what type of style or what type of theater did you start kind of designing with or you were five and you watercolored and you dressed up your dolls or <laughs> I did I did do that yeah. I did I um yeah I started just mm-hmm. like loving drawing and mm. painting and dolls and yeah. all kinds of women's crafts like knitting mm. and crocheting and lace making and sewing and anything like fibrous and textile related mm. so I was always um, kind of hoping for a rainy day when I could stay inside all day and make things and play with gotcha. things. Gotcha. And were all those materials kind of easily accessible? Like did you, did you were your parents really supportive of that or did they have were they, I don't know dressmakers and things and there's fabric all over the place or I would I would I don't want to I love my parents though they thought I was crazy oh you know (laughs) right (laughs) and there were not those things in the house so I would um look for those things like on the street or like disassemble Mm. things or like pull apart things in our house like pull apart pillows to get the fabric or like break something that yeah. like uh, lampshades or curtains or go to Goodwills and like find yeah. things really inexpensively right. or um, you know my grandmother had a sewing machine mm-hmm. that she got with something called green stamps where you have to like save up these little stamps and uh-huh. eventually if you get hundreds and hundreds you can uh-huh. purchase uh, prizes oh interesting I know it's, it's an old I love tiny it. thing yeah. yeah so it's she's very frugal and she got a sewing machine so I was aware of like sewing and I was like very inspired but she was doing very practical things mm-hmm. so I thought um I wanted to learn how to sew but my grandmother was kind of too old to teach me by the time I was really in high school mm-hmm. and um she had some dementia so she couldn't teach me but I was aware that that was something that she was really good at and then I found fashion sketches that my mother had done when she oh. was a kid and then I started to realize oh there is something you know in the family that's related to sewing right so I took a sewing class and I failed it because um I wanted to make a dress and our teacher just wanted us to make potholders so 
I kind of went too far. And she, the teacher had said, if you go for that dress, then I'm not going to help you. Like, you have to start at the bottom and work your way up. And I said, no, I, mean, I think I can do this by myself. But I, you know, I, I right. had a great time trying, yeah. but I didn't make a dress. Um, but I was able to make, like, small things and, yeah. like, collage things for dolls or mm-hmm. for myself. And eventually... I did something that my grandmother did. I had a part-time job, and, like, every day I would take my paycheck. Well, every Friday I would take my paycheck, and I would get, like, $60 a week. I'd take, like, $45 and take a bus to the sewing machine store and make a down payment on this sewing machine. Wow. And it took weeks. And, you know, my mom and dad, my sisters, everybody knew I was doing this. Yeah. And it was taking a long time. (laughs) And then one day I went to, with my paycheck... Um, my high school paycheck to the store and the sewing machine was gone. <gasps> no! And the people at the store told me like they couldn't wait any longer and that they had sold it. And did I want my deposit back? So I was crushed and I was crying and I felt like so emotional because I was really looking forward to making that final payment. And I got right. home and I was just crying my eyes out. My mother said, you know, you're so emotional. Calm down. Go upstairs to your room and just calm down. So I went upstairs and the sewing machine was there. She had made the final oh, payment. <laughs> I know. I was like, how, how sad. No. <laughs> I know. So, yeah, oh, my parents, awesome. they, did, they did think I was kind of crazy, but at the same time, they supported my love of these right. like, things, crafts and right. art and theater. But I feel like, and even though we haven't known each other for very long, mm-hmm. you come to the table very... You're, you already come so inspired and full of ideas that I think that it's easy for people to see that if you don't unleash it, where will it all go? <laughs> what will happen to Kathleen if we don't let her create, you know? So I really? think to just give you that space, too, I think we're all like, she's okay. Yeah, I was we're talking about the flower, you know, and I'm watching Eric and I'm watching Lynn just watch. And then no one is saying anything. And so you're like, yes, and the petals could be like uh-huh. adoptive parents. And we're going to have them, you know, and we're just like, Yes, Kathy. <laughs> go. You go. We will follow, you know, which I think is great. Thanks, and that's, that's probably so nice. why you've gotten so far in your career, uh, you know, because you've got that pull and people are like, I don't I don't really know what is happening, mm-hmm. but I'm into it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll try it. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank so you. what was kind of, so after high school, mm-hmm. did you study uh, full on into design? Yes. So into high school and then by high school, I will was making all my own clothes. Oh my gosh. Okay. But they weren't good. You know, they weren't constructed well. Mm-hmm. But I really, you know, came downstairs every morning with something new that I would wear. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Hey. Or I made clothes for, um, for my boyfriends or for, like, the majorettes. Or, like, I started trying to, yeah. like, um, do theatrical things. And Mm. then I went to college, and there was no major for what I wanted to do. So it was great, because it helped me refine what I wanted to do. And I was able to um, petition a lot of teachers and create my own major. So that was called Costume Design, Fashion History, and Textile Printing. Wow. So it was like theater classes at one college, that at Smith College, actually. And then um, African-American textile printing traditions at my college acting classes at another school um what they called home ec or home economics classes and like how to how to construct clothes so Mm -hmm. i finally started learning how to build clothes properly yeah and um you know i did a little acting in plays and like kind of started to get a well-rounded better education yeah wow i love how you just do it you just do it and Did you have to work up to that, or was that something that was just in you as a kid? Like, you were just like, I'm going to just do it. Just try it, you know, and there wasn't even a blink. Yeah, it's funny you say that, because Nathaniel said that to me the other day. Yeah. He said, you just do it. And I thought, yes, I do just do it. And sometimes (laughs) that gets me into trouble, because I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't know where I'm going, or I take a job and say, I I can do that, or I... I say, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I know that I'm going to do that. Yeah. So I do think I just do it. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah, no obstacles. (laughs) Yeah, and it's not like an aggressive, like, I'm going to do it, you know, (laughs) like, get out of my way, I'll do it. It's just like, yeah, Yeah. it's like, it's going to happen. 
whether you want it or not. <laughs> but let me show you how magical it could be. You know, and I think that's yeah. so, I don't know, charming and wonderful. Uh, you thanks, know? Tina. Yeah. So after you studied, mm -hmm. let's talk about Vietnam. How okay. did, yeah, how did your opportunity to go there come up? So... I graduated college. I'll just go through education quickly because I yes, did a lot please. of that. Oh, okay. Then I started immediately working at Walt Disney World Florida in the creative oh. costume department. And then I learned again how much I didn't know because I started making for bodies completely different, like 84-inch necks and like 12-inch waist, you know, crazy right. proportions and fantastical creatures, fur, plastic, walkabouts. Then I started working all over the country, just boom, 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 from op at all different opera companies, sewing, not designing, but building. Mm. So I really felt like I started to hone my s building skills. Yeah. Then, so Santa Fe, San Francisco, Florida, like all over. Then eventually I decided um, my education was so focused in costume, I wanted to learn more. So I went back to get a graduate mm. degree in dramaturgy. Mm. So then I just focused on the whole concept of event and theater making and storytelling from a dramaturgical mm. perspective. Then I started working as a dramaturg and spent some time in Germany and France and traveling where oh other <laughs> countries have dramaturgs more often yeah. than here. But you know, in the show that we did, you and me, I felt like that was I was pretty dramaturgically inclined on that one. Like being yeah. in the audience with Eric all the time and um, drawing on the boards and having more yeah. um, space in the rehearsal process to get to know everybody. Right. And then I started actually kind of getting tired of actors and performers in a yeah. funny way because I felt that too many performers wanted to look sexy and skinny and attractive and that wasn't sure. necessarily the storyline yeah so as as I started working in, um with people I would try to have to explain to them like okay you know you're sexy and you're hot and you're gorgeous but save it for the party like right now you're supposed to be at a haggard old um, troll under a bridge. Right. It's so, hard to make that really sexy. Yeah, yeah. And it's like <laughs> so you, maybe there yeah. is some some something cool in in that. But I got this opportunity to work with kids. So I started like directing plays with kids and I thought, "Oh, I'll just do this briefly because this is not what I'm supposed to do." But I realized, "Oh, I love working with kids mm. because they don't have that yeah. insecurity and like right. they just have joy and they just want to get out there and like show off and like love me I love you love me back it's great <laughs> and you know parade around yeah so they'll do anything and like no kid ever um box at a costume or puppet or like a set like they're just they just jump into it so then I started really enjoying working with kids and I did that for a while but then I thought no I still I feel like I'm I have to yank myself away from the kids because I think I'm supposed to also work with adults. So then I went to New York yeah. University and got a, a three-year MFA in theater design overall. Oh so then yes. I realized um, that I also wanted to direct, not, um, not design exclusively. So mm -hmm. I started to think, well, what do I want to direct? I yeah. think I want to direct creatures like puppets mm. and then I'll make the puppets design the characters because I think of costume design as character design mm -hmm. not just like the design of the clothes but right like an animation and I do a little animation we talk yeah. about like a, the character design like yeah. what who are they and how is right. that expressed and how they look yeah so Vietnam has this beautiful tradition that I was always crazy about of um, water puppetry Mm -hmm. So the legend has it that um, in the year, like about 1,000, mm -hmm. farmers would take their whole families out to harvest the rice, mm -hmm. and they'd flood the rice paddies, and it would take a while. You know, they'd camp out overnight as mm -hmm. the rice um, bubbled to the surface. So in the evenings, instead of, like, telling stories around the proverbial, like, campfire, families would tell stories around the bodies of water. Oh, that's lovely. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. And I think, I imagine what happened is that, you know, that goofy uncle 
kind of would hide and splash at a particular moment in the storytelling. And that would just like delight the kids and the whole family. And then they started carving wooden dolls out of bamboo, which floats, Mm -hmm. and is strong and carvable, and then floating the dolls in the water. Then started playing with fireworks and how the fireworks can actually like ignite underwater. And little by little, like each of the folks at the various like rice farms Mm -hmm. started to develop their own water puppet trees Mm -hmm. shows. They were only designed to be shown to their own families in their own communities. And the, now the wooden dolls were attached to long bamboo poles, so you never mm-hmm. saw the puppeteer. So it really appeared magical that these dolls were floating and bobbing and ducking and swimming on the surface right. of the water. And the water was so precious because that's where they're harvesting their, their rice that will feed them right. and their community. So supposedly then the emperor found out about all this, you know, before uh-huh. any other kind of canned entertainment and said, like, bring these people yeah. to me. And so they had to create bodies of water inside the, the palaces. Uh-huh. And that, is, that performance was so successful and like so popular at the time that supposedly the emperor said, this is it, we love it, and this is purely our own original tradition. This is Vietnamese. So we're going to codify it right now and freeze it and, and always hold on to this tradition. So now the stories told mm-hmm. are the same stories that were told a thousand years ago no in the body of water it's like three feet tall and there's like a silk curtain in front of it like all of the traditions are what they were supposedly one thousand years ago oh my goodness how special and intimate right yeah so it's like a time capsule of vietnamese culture too Uh uh-huh uh-huh and I know we spoke briefly about how wonderful Vietnamese people, all from Vietnam, right? They're mm-hmm. just so friendly. I mean, I'm sorry. Vietnamese people here are nice as well. Right. The ones on the <laughs> right. I'm not saying, you know. But, yeah, the culture there is very welcoming and warm and how you didn't expect to like Vietnam as much as you did, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I thought I would need a translator. I thought I would be um, just feeling on the outside all the time and feeling kind of strange like I was lucky to have this grant as an artist in residence there Mm -hmm. so I brought my puppets and they really like took me in to Mm -hmm. the 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 theater uh, ensemble and even as a fly on the wall because I can't speak Vietnamese I only learned those my five special words of like beautiful delicious thank you good (laughs) Um, yeah You can still learn so much and communicate so much without words, right? So the people were super warm and friendly and super generous and just sharing, you know, food and stories and making me feel um, that we're still friends because we all, we know that each other does something parallel or that at least we respect what each other does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so the Vietnamese people were wonderful. They have so many other stories to tell though beyond like what's allowed right now by the government so they have like dozens and hundreds of other folk tales that they like to work into the rotation yeah yeah. I thought it was interesting when I was in the hotel you know of course we all whip out our phones and Mm -hmm. we're trying to access Facebook and it's saying that it's just you know it's not going and we're trying to figure out why we can get our email we can you know and Mm -hmm. do all these things but why can't we get Facebook you know our Instagram and they're like oh it's not allowed you know and wow, we're in a totally different country and culture. Yeah. Yeah, So, I don't know, it's crazy how big the world is, but it's so lovely to see how something like art and public, even though there's a language barrier, right? Mm -hmm. How it just totally transcends through that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it really is something like, like music is that way, that like people can communicate over that and then makes the, the words feel like just details. Right, right. Would you say that you are kind of, like a conceptual artist then because you have so many skills that doesn't necessarily give you a title right like you're not just designer you're not just director you're not just a puppeteer you Mm -hmm. know but you have a lovely sense of concepts and story right and Mm, so thank you you can kind of do it all Oh, uh, no. Right? I mean, you can. No. Thank I, you, though. I mean, you if you had a full year and everything was paid for, <laughs> <laughs> and you just had time to just work on it, yeah, I bet you could. Oh, thanks, I bet you Dina. could. Thanks. Yeah. No, but that's also so, what's so great about theater is that it's so collaborative. Like, mm. And it's so wonderful. Like, when Eric brings me down here for this, this week, it's like we do, it's so 
valuable. There's so much um, magic and preciousness of being in the room together. Yeah. Like, not just for like sizing and um, fitting. It's just bringing all these pieces together to make the whole show, for example, in Thumbelina, look like yeah. it was crafted by one pair of hands, mm. you know, and yeah. conceived by one mind. But because really we should all be working so seamlessly together, like without ego, that we don't yeah. worry. Whose idea was that? Who made that? Where did that come from? That it's just it's all come from the um, the ensemble, like the, the energy of us all together. Yeah. Oh, ego is a good word, right? <laughs> yeah. That's an important one to kind of keep in check. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah for all of us. So it's, yeah, that's a great attitude to kind of come into. Because you have to, because you're right. Ultimately, the show has to seem cohesive, right? And yeah. smooth and flowing and fluid. and Yeah, and we, we are not in it. Yeah. Like, so we don't, the director doesn't get up and, you know, make any explanations right. or, you know, the kids aren't interested. Or the, yeah. the, it's just really like... The proof is in the practice, I guess. Yeah. What would you say were kind of your biggest struggles thus far? As a, as a theater maker? I think, as a, yeah, as a theater maker, as a, I don't know, anything. Um, as an artist, just a je- an artist, yeah. You know, some, I, I struggle with turning down work. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I, it's hard to say no. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to say no when within the job, if, no matter what, if someone asks me to do something. Yeah. It's hard to say no because why, why no? Because there's not enough time? Because I'm, what, what, what is, like anything I say mm-hmm. to myself, it doesn't really justify. Like I feel like it's hard to say no. So I struggle with that. And I struggle with, saying no to any gig that comes up mm. so because yeah. I, I want to do it if the show sounds right or if I really like the the team um, or I've always wanted to do that story it's just hard to say no but realistically um, I have to I have to you know pay rent I right. have to like you know work it out so that yeah. um that I can continue to love my work and not get burnt out yeah. by it. How do you find that balance? Um, yeah, especially when you have so many projects going at once because I know that you're doing more than just one thing <laughs> constantly, right? <laughs> right? So how do you find the time to kind of give yourself a break or, you know, what do you tell yourself to kind of get through the days when you feel like, oh, no, can't, I can't? <laughs> um, I feel so much satisfaction in the work like I love to come in this morning and look at this dress and like keep arranging you know what's going where and thinking of you in it and how that make will make it come to life like it's mm. that's that's energizing and I would say like working out and swimming and doing yoga and like exercising mm. actually is energizing oh. so on the days when I think I don't have time or I'm too busy or too important I don't have to go to the gym something like that like yeah. um it's it's bad because I feel so much better and I feel so much more um taken care of and and happy and energized and healthy when I take the time to go to the gym or mm-hmm. eat well or go swimming like here right. um I'm really gonna try to go surfing tomorrow morning oh good yeah. and that means yeah. like getting up at six whatever but I'll feel like great the rest of the day yeah Oh, you're just like junior. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Because you just yeah, absolutely. But you have to, and it's addicting, and yeah, you need to feed yourself, and you feel you know? small, and it's good to feel so small because sometimes it feels like what we're doing is like so urgent, and it is, and it's so much work in a short amount of time. But when you go out like into the ocean, for example, like you realize how small you are, and how like we're he- we're in this big, beautiful world, and we're here for such a brief time, and we're so tiny. So that's like a, yeah. a good feeling under the big sky, you know, not under like the the black ceiling of a black box or right. theater proscenium. Yeah, you know? but we like what we're doing. I think in theater, it's like we're trying to bring all that into this space. Yeah. So it's good to go out into all that. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Huh. <laughs> what is like your life statement, Kathleen? I feel like how. 
you know how do you get to this enlightened place that you find yourself <laughs> or that I'm not. finding you <laughs> it's like oh no, this is a not guru in the making <laughs> no you know, it's that not. was so beautiful are you kidding oh, me thanks. that was great yeah you know no that's razzle dazzle what am I saying <laughs> no I mean I think you know you've got such great insight about how to about maybe it's just a great sense of self-awareness, you know, and knowing where you are and being able to connect with people and really you know, to be kind, to be a good person on the mm-hmm. daily, you know. And I just wonder, is there something, not a quote, but is there like a life manifesto that you live by? Or, you know, is there something that you always tell yourself? For example, I know this other lady who um, owns this store that I work with and she, her biggest thing is to just be kind always Mm -hmm. and that's how and it totally reflects in the way that she runs her business in Mm -hmm. the way that she um you know takes care of her employees the way Mm -hmm. that she takes up her dog her husband you know all these different things it's just to be kind always and I think that definitely reflects her style Mm -hmm. so I would yeah so I just ask is there just an ideal that you really hold on to and love and feel like you live your life by I think yeah, I think I have a few, but it's funny that you say be kind because I think in in this field, the best advice I ever got was be kind to everybody. Mm. And at the time, I thought, yeah, sure, you know, golden rule, okay. But it was really right before I kind of went out into the world, you know, one of my mentors at grad school, and I just, he looked at me and he said, no, really, think about this when you're out there. Be kind to everyone. It's going to be difficult. And I thought, oh. You know, there was like a moment. And I just thought, hmm. And I think it's true. We have to, you know, like our moms tell us, be treat others like you want to be treated because it's probably hard for others to be kind to me or to us Mm -hmm. all, all sometimes. So I think we do try to be kind to everyone. It just makes you feel better. Yeah. It makes um, everybody live more smoothly. I'm not yeah. saying I do it all the time at all. Right. But yeah, but yeah kindness is so um, simple but difficult too. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel, and I don't really know about the costuming world or the design world at all, but... Um, I feel for a while that theater was definitely a male-dominated field, right? Mm -hmm. And so being a woman and having all these credentials and things um, and having your own journey, have you ever felt particularly small? Not in just because you're a woman, Mm -hmm. you know? But, Mm -hmm. I mean, were there certain struggles that you didn't necessarily see with with others? Yes. Yeah, I'd say absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that is also related to kindness because I think sometimes kindness Mm -hmm. can be perceived as something else. Mm. Or some some people might try to kind of take advantage of kindness. Sure. Um, In costume, costume is traditionally a female position. Right. And it is associated with um, care and love and home and dressing so I think um, I learned early on like the actor has to trust me they, mm. they actually get naked like I see their scars and their freckles their tattoos their cellulite their bones like I see everything so it's a very intimate bond and trust and that is not exactly related to being a woman but it's just related to being how we're going to behave together like kind of keeping a work vibe and like a trust going um but as far as like sometimes I would say like as a maybe just also because I'm petite and because I'm a woman I do feel that I have to really get serious and explain what I need to get the job done and not apologize for it not make excuses not um, be shy about it because it's not 
something that I'm personally requesting. It's what's best for the show. Mm. But costume, sometimes people think they have an understanding of it because they, they wear clothes every day. <laughs> and they, they associate sewing with some kind of something that like older generations and ladies did um, where they might think about set building as like requires more skill because not everybody builds every day and um, mm. I just you know they mm -hmm. people live in buildings and work in buildings but they 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 <laughs> it's hard to explain but right. but I I, see I, what I, you mean. I feel sometimes that there is a tradition of women being costume designers and men being set designers and women are expected to do an awful lot for mm. well i think it's it's up to us as designers whatever gender we are to like explain what we're doing to those yeah. who don't know and i kind of joke with my set designer friends like that couch isn't going to tell you that it looks fat and pink and, he's, and the couch is not going to refuse to wear the dress right <laughs> but my actor can do that and that couch like once you upholster it everyone's going to agree and we're going to rearrange everything around the couch because people have a respect for how much work and money and time resources it took to upholster that couch right. but if an actor walks onto stage in a costume so often it's the first thing that people say that they'll change and it's so much work and it's there's right. so much thought what that went into it um so the costume i mean we're like we're dressing and we're upholstering moving creatures and bodies with emotions and feelings both as the character and as individuals mm -hmm. so i think just like the way you know costume designers are always carrying heavy things mm -hmm. set designers have taxis and they have assistants and they have set shops it's like yeah. there is something there it's like a vestigial gender thing that's still around and i i don't mind it because i love what i do but i i am aware of it yeah there is still like this old like ghost of a hierarchy there yeah yeah i know it's hard to put your finger on it but it, i know it's, it's yes. i know it's there <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? We see you. <laughs> yeah. It comes up sometimes. Right. It comes up in contracts or it comes up in playbills. It comes up in in things. It's like I look around and like, oh, that's from the 1920s mm. and it's still here. Or that perception is from, you know, vaudeville. Yeah. So interesting. <laughs> I know. What do you think? What will it take? Yeah. For that dynamic to change do you think um i think we just have to like be honest with each other and like acknowledge and, and have a good sense of humor like we've adopted some traditions that we've taken for granted that um are from an an older time yeah so it does require it requires me for example if i'm like relegated to a basement with no resources um, to say to, to stand up and say like that may have been what's happened before or that may have worked before but to be fair and to get the job done well this is what we need to do um, so this can be a little uncomfortable sometimes to have those conversations mm -hmm. because especially as a freelancer you just come in you roll into town and you just want to accept whatever is there it's kind of like yeah. you're a guest in someone's home Mm -hmm. So you don't want to complain about the sheets. Yeah. But there are traditions that mm -hmm. are uh, being upheld, and it's not to our benefit. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are the good traditions, but I think right. there are some gender-based, like, biases. That, that even in there. theater, where we're so, we, we like to yeah. be so open-minded, um, they're just, we've just inherited them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could give just one piece of advice or I don't know a fist bump <laughs> <laughs> to ladies who are trying to make it out there in the theater world um, or who are just creative and don't really know where to start you know or might mm -hmm. have some doubts about themselves uh, what would you say to them I mean I think I just say 
this quote of this at this elementary school that I I work at sometimes it's called dream big and work hard mm-hmm. it's like ah oh, that's the best those are the best four words dream yeah. big and work hard like I think work hard is um, something with it's it's with in everybody's grasp we can all work hard we just have to enjoy it and if you enjoy the work um, you enjoy pushing yourself to to kind of keep challenging yourself and work harder and dreaming big is also instinctive and um, we can all do it we all have dreams and we all have like imagination and vision so it's just like just draw 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 read just keep yeah. reading and drawing like connecting whatever is here like w- with your hand yeah. and like getting it out because otherwise it's just stays in your head and then it's really ephemeral and it's just a fleeting moment and yeah. it's not shared not even like manifested for yourself like you gave me that great little notebook that I love that says um, oh, yeah. believe in your crazy ideas and yeah. I think that's exactly what I'm saying is like take this idea this big dream or this crazy idea mm-hmm. who's saying it's crazy it's not crazy yeah it's real it's big and it might seem impossible or challenging but who cares because you're going to take it from your head and like put it in your body put it in your hands and then put it on the table and manifest it yeah. and it's like so satisfying yeah so I think everybody can dream big everybody can work hard and mm-hmm. everybody um can draw and yeah and some people say think they can't draw, but we can all move a pencil around, you know, <laughs> to to get our uh, yeah. to communicate to get our ideas across. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.